I saw a film a few months ago that just inspired me on so many levels. I was reading at the time the biography of Michelangelo, and so when I saw the title on the airplane, The Lost Leonardo, I thought, I'm interested in that. Clicked on the little description, it pops up. And the movie basically tells the story of a piece of art. The piece of art was in an art auction in New Orleans in 2005, and the description of this painting was, and the time, or right after the time of Leonardo, meaning Leonardo da Vinci. And that would put it at about maybe early 1500s. And so as you unfold this documentary film, you're watching along, all of a sudden you realize these art investors slash collectors come to New Orleans, they're looking through the catalog, they see the description, you know, after Leonardo, and they're also attached immediately to the painting, and they buy it. They buy this painting for $1,275. The painting is called Salvator Mundi, translates savior of the world. Painting looks like this. They were mesmerized by this image. So they took the painting home, they decided to investigate a little bit further, and as you watch the movie, anybody seen the movie, by the way, The Lost Leonardo? Anybody seen the film? So far, we've, okay, <laughs> two people. Uh, so far, we've gone across uh, three gatherings and the movie's not doing very well. But <laughs> we can change that. So as the documentary unfolds, basically, the movie is the process of trying to authenticate the painting, trying to date it and potentially authenticate it because as that process unfolds, it's taken to the leading art restorer on the planet in New York. And as people begin to strip off some of the restoration work that's been done and get down underneath the surface and start looking at this piece of art, they begin to ask the question, is it maybe not after Leonardo, is it possibly a Leonardo? And so they strip away some of what you would normally see they take this thing to the Louvre in Paris at one point, and they're using the highest investigative techniques available to study the painting. And at the end of the painting, they come to the conclusion that most likely the Salvador Mundi is a work of Leonardo da Vinci, making it one of 15 pieces of art in existence by Leonardo one of them being the Last Supper painted on a fresco in Milan, one of them being the Mona Lisa, which is hanging in the Louvre in Paris, France. And so, ultimately, the painting, are you ready for this, is sold in 2017 to someone who definitely believes that it's a Leonardo, what was originally bought in New Orleans for $1,275 is sold for the highest price ever paid for a piece of art in history at Christie's Auction House in London, 2017, the Salvador Mundi sells for $450 million <laughs> to a Saudi prince. The painting hasn't been seen since the auction, but is purportedly hanging on his half a billion dollar yacht the savior of the world. <laughs> what was interesting to me watching the film was how many times people were saying Salvador Mundi. So there are art restorers, art critics, uh, museum curators, there are financial investors, members of the media. This thing became a social media sensation around the globe before the auction at Christie's. And it was amazing to me how many different people in the film were saying, Salvador Mundi, savior of the world, Salvador, the Mundi, the savior, the savior of the world, Salvador Mundi, savior of the world, savior of the world, savior of the world. Uh, we counted it up 45 times people say Salvador Mundi or a version of it, and 71 times that name appears in the film. Oftentimes they'll zoom in because it's a documentary on a New York Times article, and you'll see Salvador Mundi or a social media post, and you'll see Salvador Mundi. So across the one hour and 36 minutes of this film, 71 times Savior of the World. Savior of the World. Savior of the World. Savior of the World. And everyone in the film is asking... Is it 
a Leonardo da Vinci. And I'll, I'll let you watch the film and you can come to your own conclusion. But every single person in the movie is asking the same question. Is it a da Vinci? And not one time in the film did anyone ever ask the question, is he the savior of the world? It's a $450 million question, apparently, as to whether it's a da Vinci or not. But far more important, infinitely more important, is the question, is he the savior of the world? And so when you watch the film, you'll know if you want to in the future, get a piece of art authenticated or dated, you'll kind of see how that works out. But what if we were asking today the far greater question, is in fact he the savior of the world? How would we authenticate that question? How could we come to an answer that you would feel certain about, that you would feel like you could bank on, that you would feel like I've got all the information I need to know whether or not I should consider this person the savior of the world. Because if he is in fact the savior of the world, that would make him the most important person who has ever walked on planet earth. And it would make him someone that would demand that all of us do the work and investigate this claim. So how would you do that? Well, you could do it uh, by going to the checkout aisle at uh, any store in town uh, on display just recently on the shelf as you're waiting for your time to get your last Kit Kat and put that in with the order was life asking the question, who do you say that I am? Ten years ago, on the same checkout line was Time Magazine, 100 events that changed the world. I'm happy uh, to see that Jesus made the cover of the 100 events that changed the world and really thrilled to let you know that he makes the list at number 11 of the 100 things that changed the world. And the, these aren't the only two options. There's another cover here that is asking the question, who was he? Another cover, 1996, now things are getting a little bit heated on this one, the search for Jesus. Some scholars are debunking the Gospels. So people apparently are asking the question, is he Salvador Mundi? Is he the savior of the world? And not just a few, lots of people are asking the question. So if you want to authenticate if he's the savior of the world, you've got some options that you can look to, or you can go to history. You can go to Josephus, the leading Jewish historian of the time of Jesus, and he writes about Jesus. What would be the value for a Jewish historian to write Jesus Christ and his crucifixion into history, but he's a historian, and so he snapshots Jesus in the moment as does Tacitus, a leading Roman historian of the day of Jesus. So you can go and look into history to find an answer to the question, or you can look here to the eyewitness accounts of the Gospels in the Word of God to answer the question, is Jesus, in fact, the Savior of the world? Now, I know a lot of people from all places on the spectrum of belief come to church on Sunday on Easter. And so there may be people in the place today who would say, hey, I would expect you, uh, pastor, to say that we should look at the gospels and the word of God to answer the question, authenticate, is Jesus the savior of the world? But um, I heard from my literature professor when I was in college, or actually I was just talking to my coworker at work the other day, and they were reminding me that the word of God really isn't that dependable because in fact, hasn't it been changed like many, many times across history? I mean, we don't have the original manuscripts of the Word of God, and so what was originally breathed by God would have been copied by people, and surely a lot has been added to it over centuries, and you know, a few things might have been taken out of it over time, and certain leaders would have bent it a little bit this way for their philosophy, or some other ruler would bend it a little bit this way for their particular agenda, right? So we, we, we can't say for sure that everything in the Word of God is actually what was originally in the Word of God. 
In fact, in the Time magazine, uh, coming in at number 11, uh, they, they mention this. Here's the way this is described. And a lot of this is pretty good. In fact, if this was the only thing you ever had to know about Jesus, you would almost get it from this little paragraph right here. Uh, starts out, uh, there is no doubt that Jesus Christ is one of the most significant individuals in history. And then it comes down to the bottom. Remember, this is 2010. Today, some 2.2 billion Christians believe that Jesus was the Messiah promised in Judaism's Old Testament. The Son of God, incarnate as a man, whose suffering and death absolve sins and promise eternal life to those who heed his message. His story is told in the four Gospels of the Christian's New Testament, which most scholars regard as true to Christ's message, if not the exact facts of his life. Had to get that in there. They record, talking about the Gospels, Jesus' divine birth, his teachings, his miracles, his death, and resurrection. And they record his enduring challenge, a radical call to charity that is far easier said than done. Christians must love their enemies and forgive those who sin against them. So the Gospels, are they really an exact representation of his life? Are they truly the words of Jesus? Can this word be trusted? Well, I think the best way to answer that question is to simply say, yes, this is the most authenticated ancient document that you will ever hold in your hand. It is the most validated and trustworthy ancient work that you will ever hold. The version of it that you actually have in your hands right now. Let me show you uh, how this works. Let's look back at some other ancient works and see how they stack up with the New Testament. We're going to begin uh, with Suetonius. I know everybody was hoping when you came to church on Easter that we were going to do some literary history. So um, try to contain your enthusiasm as we walk through this. But I think it'll be inspiring if you haven't seen it before. And the, you could pick a, a hundred examples. I just chose a few. Suetonius was a Roman historian. I don't know if you've heard of his works, the uh, 12 Caesars or not, but a lot of what we know about Roman history we know from Suetonius. And so he was writing in A.D. 75 to 100, which is the time that the New Testament church was exploding across that part of the world. The earliest copy of any of his work is from A.D. 950. You say, well, why is that? Because all these early works were written on papyrus, and papyrus is not a durable surface. And so the, say one of the Gospels would have been written on a papyrus, which probably would have dissolved into dust in about 100 years. And so what would happen was you would have your original and then someone would copy the original and maybe send that to another uh, person and that one would get copied and that one would get copied and that one would get copied. And same with the work of the Roman historian Suetonius. And the earliest copy we have is 950, meaning there's an 800 year gap from the copy we have to the original. But then you wanna ask the question because we're gonna look at these copies so that we can see how close are all these copies to each other to give us the textual purity of this manuscript. And for Suetonius, we have eight existing copies of his work. Let's go to Tacitus, another Roman historian who wrote about Jesus and about his followers. He was writing in AD 100. The earliest copy, 1100 AD, thousand year gap, we have 20 copies of his work. But let's look at something we have a lot more confidence in, and that's the work of Homer. And you may have read the Iliad somewhere along the way. It was written in B.C. 900, our earliest copy, B.C. 400, a 500-year gap. But look at the copies. Look at the volume of the copies we have. So you can feel confident, by the way, when you're reading the Iliad, you, you're good. 643 copies of Homer's work. So let's talk about the New Testament for a moment. This contested work, this undermined work, this work that seeds are always sown about of doubt and about the ability for us to test and believe in its veracity. The earliest complete New Testament copy we have, 350 AD. 
written A.D. 50 to 100, so look at the approximate time between the earliest copy we have, the Codex Sinaiticus, and the time of writing. And then you would say, well, how many manuscripts do we have? Well, the New Testament was written in Greek primarily, and its time, that was the language spoken of the people uh, in Jesus' time. And so the manuscripts, the earliest ones, are all written in Greek. And so the Greek manuscripts, how many do we have? Right now, we have 5,800 manuscripts of the New Testament in Greek. Now, in Latin, we have also another 10,000 manuscripts, and in other languages, Syriac, Coptic, Hebrew, Aramaic, 10,000 more manuscripts, so over 25,000 copies of the manuscripts of the New Testament. When God was saying, you can look to the Gospels and the Word of God if you're looking for a way to authenticate the claim that Jesus is Savior of the world, he wanted to make sure that you knew that the evidence was overwhelmingly in your favor. We're standing on solid ground. And you say, well, okay, we've got all these manuscripts then, and you talked about how we compare all the copies to see, do they all say the same thing? The textual purity, according to the textual critics of the New Testament, is 99.5%. Now, you're going to hear different stories if you're listening uh, to the world. There's a book that was very popular recently called Misquoting Jesus, Who Changed the Bible and Why? It got a lot of traction, New York Times bestseller list. The writer of it, who is a textual critic, made all the talk shows because of his statement where he said, there are more copying errors in the manuscripts than there are words in the New Testament. And that got so much buzz and so much attention because everybody wanted to hear the bad news about the New Testament. And so all the talk shows, that was all of the story. But the true story was, as other textual critics started responding to this work, was that 99.5% of the errors that were being talked about were simple stylistic errors or word order errors. For example, a Greek sentence, the words can go in a lot of different orders, and you could take 20 words and mix them up hundreds of different ways and have the exact same meaning in Greek. And so all these errors that were purportedly so overwhelming were stylistic, and eventually, when the paperback copy of the book came out, there was a tiny, tiny nod to say, well, actually, uh, all these uh, copying errors that I've been talking about in no way changed the meaning of the text. So we've got overwhelming volume, we've got overwhelming purity, so that then we can open this Word of God and know that what we're holding in our hands is precious. To say it uh, for all of us in Atlanta, Georgia today, the book is good, (laughs) y'all. And it invites our investigation. Um, you say, well, I'm, I'm just kind of waiting, you know, for the other shoe to drop. I'm f- figuring out eventually somebody's going to find Pandora's box and open it up. Just go, back. Oh, here's all the people that made up Christianity. No, it's going to work the other way around, actually, because that's the way it's been working for the last several thousand years. In 1935, they were working at John Ryland's library in Manchester, uh, England. And a guy named Colin was going through a collection of papyri that they had bought from a collector in Egypt. And as he's working through this collection, he finds a little tiny fragment that catches his attention. The fragment is the size of a credit card. But what's on it is absolutely stunning. When he saw this little fragment, he immediately realized that this is something unlike anything I've ever seen before. He sent it to the leading experts in papyri in the world, and they began to study it and try to date this little tiny fragment. And as they did, they dated it almost to the time of its original writing. And that matters to us today because written on the fragment is the Gospel of John chapter 18. On one side, 
part portion of verses 31 to 33 on the back side, written on the other side of the papyrus, verses 37 and 38. These verses are what we're preaching about and proclaiming today on this little fragment found from a collection in Egypt, now in a museum on display in a library in Manchester, England. It says this on one side. Pilate said, take him yourselves and judge him by your own law. But we have no right to execute anyone, they objected. This took place to fulfill what Jesus had said about the kind of death he was going to die. Pilate then went back inside the palace, summoned Jesus and asked him, are you the king of the Jews? Now flip to the other side of the little fragment. You are a king then, said Pilate. Jesus answered, you say that I'm a king. In fact, the reason I was born and came into the world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. What is truth, retorted Pilate. And maybe that's the question you're asking today. What is truth? And with this, he went out again to the Jews gathered there and said, I find no basis for a charge against him. Now, this is stunning for several reasons. Number one, the book of John, the gospel of John, it has been dated around 100 AD, but some think uh, maybe as early as 90 AD or slightly earlier than that. But this frag fragment, the John Ryland's papyrus, P52 is the way it's known. This fragment has been dated by the experts that Colin sent it to on discovery of it at 150, 100, but one expert dated it at 90 AD. So where Salvador Mundi was the period following Leonardo, this fragment is the period following John or actually could be contemporaneous with the original manuscript in circulation. God has preserved a little piece of his word so that you and I today, when we open up this gospel to the book of John, we know we are on good ground to answer the most important question in the moment. Is he the savior of the world? I take us to John chapter 3, a passage of scripture that is incredibly uh, well known throughout the church, and even the reference of it, John 3, 16, is known to people uh, outside of the church because they've seen it so many places in culture. And I want to just set a context today because, um, you know, I know Tim Tebow put John 3, 16 on his, uh, on his eye patch. Uh, and it became, when he did that the first time, the most searched item in Google, on Google in the world in that moment during that football game, the most searched thing on planet Earth was John 316. It's been held up at signs at sporting events. Have you ever been watching the Super Bowl and some guy's gotten right in the camera shot behind the goalpost and he's got John 316 written on a little poster or maybe you've seen it on a billboard or sometimes when you're just driving out through the suburbs and you get out a little bit further into the country and you'll see somebody just put a big sign out in their front yard, you know, Jesus saves and then another one over here, John 316 people driving by. And so John 316 has made it onto bumper stickers and bracelets, and it's kind of in the mix, but that's not the way John 316 started. John 316, this is, this is going to blow your mind, was spoken in a conversation between Jesus and a guy who came to investigate whether or not he was truly the savior of the world. A man named Nicodemus living in Jesus' day, was a part of the sect called the Pharisees. The Pharisees were Jewish people who really did not like Jesus or his teachings. But Nicodemus' heart was warming to this man because he realized something is going on through this man, Jesus, unlike anything I've ever seen before. The Pharisees were all about the outside. They were all about performance. They were all about the show. They were all about the religious exterior. They were all about knowing it all and doing it all. They were all about the external. 
But Nicodemus was having something going on on the inside of his life. And he knew he couldn't come to Jesus in the daytime and have a conversation. So it says in John chapter 3, and at night he came to the place where Jesus was staying. Can you imagine how this goes down? Hey, guy outside says his name's Nicodemus. He's one of the Pharisees. He wants to know if he can come in and talk. Jesus is like, oh, come on, come on, come on in. So now you've got Nicodemus and Jesus at a table. And Nicodemus says to him, I can tell by your works and the power that you display that you're not from this place. And Jesus answers him in a crazy way. You can read it right in John chapter 3. He says, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. That's where that phrase came from, by the way, being born again. Jesus spoke it. He says, unless you're born again, you can't see the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus, of course, you know, default, first time these words have been spoken to a person, as far as we know, says, hello, I don't see how that's going to work. How can a man, Nicodemus replies, when he's old, when he's grown, when he's this big, how can he enter into his mom and be born again? I don't see how that's going to work. And Jesus said, no, I'm not talking about being born of the flesh. I'm talking about being born of the spirit. Everyone in these gatherings, everyone watching, wherever you are around the world, we all have one thing in common today, and that is we were all born of the flesh, and we're all living right now, or we wouldn't be in this gathering. And how did you get born of the flesh? Your mom and dad. Yeah, God was superintending the process, but it was literally your mom's life blood that sustained you until the moment of your birth. And that's why Jesus said to Nicodemus, flesh gives birth to flesh. But then he said, Nicodemus, spirit gives birth to spirit. In other words, I'm not talking about your mom. I'm talking about your creator. I'm not talking about going back inside your mom's womb and being born again in a fleshly way. I'm talking about being connected to your creator and being born again in a spiritual way. Because the other thing we all have in common in this gathering is every one of us was created flesh and spirit. You are more than cells wrapped around flesh and bone. You were created in the image of God and you have a spirit within you. And actually, that's the most important part of you. But the dilemma, the problem, the insurmountable was that our sinful choices caused our spirit to be dormant and dead, thus separating us from our creator God. And Jesus is now at a table with a Pharisee who's got questions, and he's saying, you've come to the right place, Nicodemus, because I'm telling you how to be born again. And he describes it. He comes to this famous verse, John 3, 16, and he looks across the table. Are are you with me today? He doesn't say, oh, Nicodemus, I got it for you, and then he holds up a poster, John 3, 16. No, he he looks across the table and he says, Nick, Nick, this is so great. You're going to love this, Nick. Can you imagine being Nicodemus? You are hearing John 3.16 spoken out of the mouth of Jesus himself for the very first time. He has no clue that this is going to be recorded by John, eyewitness account, probably in the vicinity of this conversation happening. He has no idea it's going to become a hallmark. It's going to be preached on every continent. It's going to be a doorway for billions of people. He has no idea. He's just in a conversation trying to figure out, who are you? And how do I get whatever it is that you've got? And Jesus said, you got to be born again, man. How do, you, how do you get born again? What is the story here? And Jesus says, I'll tell you the story, Nick. Here's the story. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, Nick. <laughs> that whoever believes in 
him would not perish, but would have everlasting life. And you, you got to realize we're, we're in a moment. We're not driving by a billboard. We're in a moment, and Nicodemus is going. And he said, no. Now listen to this. And then he adds this phrase. He says in verse 17, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. OK, you ready? What is our question? Is the guy in the painting the savior of the world? That's our question. Is he Salvador Mundi? And Jesus answers the question, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Jesus was saying, I am Salvador Mundi. I am the sent one of God. I am the one who reconciles people to their creator. I'm the means by which God can give life again. I am the way that hearts that are doomed and dead because of sin burst forth into brand new everlasting life because of the grace of God and the finished work of the cross and the empty tomb. Jesus is saying, I am savior of the world and I'm right here in front of you. And he's saying that to you today. If you're thinking today that God's plan is to condemn you, you do not understand the gospel. God doesn't need to condemn you. In our sin, we're already condemned. We're already guilty. We already got no shot and no chance with a holy God. We couldn't be more condemned than we are now apart from Christ. So God isn't going to come into your life and say, let me pour a little bit more condemnation on you. He already knows you're fully under it. And you don't need condemnation. You need a way to be forgiven and free. It's no accident that he's having this conversation with Nicodemus. Because you know what the Pharisees did? They went around condemning everybody. They had all the perfect exterior. Interior, a mess, just like everybody else. But man, could they put on a front? Did they know all the information? Did they have super high standards that they were going to hold everybody to? And so they went throughout the cities and they would say, you're not good enough. You're not going to make it. God would never let you in the temple, and we're not either. You actually cannot walk on the same side of the street as we can. You are never going to have a shot with God. You, oh, don't even think about it. You have messed up your life so bad that there isn't even a chance that you should think that God's going to bring you back into his good graces. They condemned, judged held themselves to a higher standard, rode in on their high horse. But when Nicodemus came to meet Jesus in the night, Jesus shattered that all and said, hey, I'm not like you. All show in a mess on the inside. I am pure throughout, and I am the highest standard, but I am not here to condemn people. I'm here to save the lost. I am here to offer hope. I am here to bring forgiveness. I am here to pay the price. I am here to wipe away the debt. I am here to make a way for people to come back to God. I want to be known as Salvador Mundi. Paint me if you will. But I proclaim, God so loved you. Please don't leave Easter today and not know that the heart of heaven is bent toward you. And if Jesus were at that table with you right now, he'd say, do you know I love you? Do you know that I love you? Do you know that God loves you? Do you know that God loves you? 
Do you know that God loves you? Did you know that God loves you? Did you know that he still loves you? That he's never stopped loving you? Before you were born, he loved you? That sitting in that place you're sitting in right now, he loves you? And you're like, okay, Louie, I get it. I get it. I feel it. Just tell me, what do I got to do? How, how do I make it up? How, how, do I, how do I fix it? How do I... How to clean up this mess? How do I get back to God? How, what, tell me what to do. Jesus already did. He said, whoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. That's how you get born again. You don't do anything. You don't pay anything. You don't earn anything. You don't achieve anything. You don't strive for anything. You just believe in something. You're like, believe, what does that mean? Like, I believe I'm at church right now? No, not like that kind of belief that intellectual nod, not that kind of belief, the kind of belief that says, I put my confident trust in the finished work of Jesus. I believe that what he paid on the cross was enough. I believe that if I ask him, he'll forgive me. I believe that if he forgives me, I'll come to brand new spiritual life. I believe when I come to brand new spiritual life, I will be a son or a daughter of God. I believe that when this flesh fails and dies, that my spirit will live on with him for ever. I believe his grace is bigger than all my mess. I believe in Jesus. Whoever believes. So that's how you get born again. So could we ask maybe the most important question? Have you been born again? I know there's a date in history where you were born one time, but when was the moment in time when you were born again? You're like, well, I've always believed in God. Didn't ask that question. Well, my mom, she was a real strong Christian. Go, mom. Oh, our family, we were always Methodists growing up. Yay. Well, you know, we were Catholic. We were Protestant. Well, my granddad was a pastor. Well, my aunt, you know, she served at the church. Well, I've been to Easter before. I have a Bible. I actually like Jesus. I don't have any problem really with the whole Easter story. Great, congratulations on all of that. The, the question we're asking is, have you been born again? Because being a Methodist isn't gonna get you into heaven. No one's gonna ask you at the door. You Methodist? I'm Presbyterian? What kind of Presbyterian? Okay. You Baptist? Bible church? Home church? Some church? A little church? One time church? Online church? Nobody cares. Only living souls in Christ arrive into heaven forever. Have you been born again? And I'll tell you who's on my heart right now. It's someone who's been in a dozen Easter gatherings before, and you know the run sheet, but you've never believed. You've never said, I put my confident trust in the finished work of Jesus. I want to be born again. So we're going to pray together. All locations, Cumberland here, 515, Trillis, anybody in Africa or Asia. I'm just going to invite you just, if you would, just to close your eyes, bow your head, just allows you to lock in with God. And I want to give anyone in this gathering the opportunity right now to put your confident trust in the finished work of Jesus and know from this moment you are born again to brand new life. You could feel like you are the furthest person
Or maybe you taught Sunday school somewhere along the way at the other church. And anybody in between, Jesus is at the table. He's calling you by name. He's saying, here's the gospel. I didn't come into the world to make you feel worse. I came into the world to save the world and to save you. Anybody need that? Like, Louis, my life is a wreck. Everything is upside down. I have no clue what to do. I'm overwhelmed by frustration, by my failures. There's so much junk behind the closet door. And if I can have a brand new start, be born again to a brand new life today because of God's work, I want it. I need it. I need a savior of the world. I need Salvador Mundi. Then just ask him. It has to be your faith, but I'll help you. Just tell him, say, dear Jesus, I'm asking you to save my life right now. I do believe, tell him, that you are the savior of the world. But I'm asking you today to be my savior. Just thank him, thank him. Say, Jesus, thank you for giving your life for me. I ask you to forgive me for all my sin. And I'm asking you to wash all the guilt, all the shame, all the failure, all the stain away. I'm asking you, Jesus, to give me a brand new heart, a brand new life, a brand new start. Tell him, Jesus, I want to know you. I want to follow you all the days of my life. I want to be born again, a son, a daughter of God. That's belief and that's confident trust. And if that's what you are placing in Jesus right now, then right in this moment, he's saving you. That confident trust, that faith is what's saving you. His grace did the work. Your faith is what is saving you. His grace made the way. It is your faith that is saving you. We're saved by grace through faith. It's the work of God. So just thank him. Say, Jesus, thank you for saving me right here and right now. I believe it and I receive it. In Jesus' name. Amen.